My Bible is open to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, and we'll be getting back into the book of Hebrews after Christmas, but until then, we're answering the question that we just sang about, what child is this? And uh, last week, um, we looked at the promised child. Christ is the promised child. This week, Christ, we look at and examine Christ as the servant child. And we find that in Philippians chapter 2, if you'll look with me there in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. Father, I thank you for this, your word that we have just read, and I pray that you would open it now to our hearts and our minds and understanding, and by your Holy Spirit, Lord, we pray that you will apply the truth of your word to our hearts. Help me as I preach to do so in faithfulness to your word and in obedience to your spirit. And Lord, I just pray uh, for your blessing on, on the preaching this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This time of year, if you turn on certain radio stations, you will hear Christmas songs. I don't say Christmas carols because not, not all of them, in fact, a good majority of them are not Christmas carols, but you will hear Christmas songs, right? And I like that. I like the stations going to all Christmas songs. It's fun. And uh, I, I'm, I'm going to pick on a couple of songs, and I, I'm not picking on them necessarily because I don't listen to them or don't like them, but it's just... Uh, look, let me have some fun, all right? Um, but have you ever noticed selfish Christmas songs? Uh, Christmas songs that are, they're fun. I, I'm not, I listen to them, too. And there are some that I don't listen to. Uh, probably the worst Christmas song ever written is written by um, Paul McCartney, Simply Having a Wonderful Christmas Time. That is the worst song ever. <laughs> um, and if you like that song, I'm sorry if I offended you. I should probably pick better things to offend people over, but... Uh, I mean, that one's, that one's up there on my list of, of all times worst songs. But some, some, uh, some Christmas songs are just, they're not really about Christmas. They're just very self-centered and self-focused. They're about me with some Christmas glitz, right? For instance, all I want for Christmas is you. What's that got to do with Christmas? Uh, basically, it is... The song's all about, hey, you were here last year, and I can't have a good Christmas unless you're back, so start feeling guilty and get back here, right? It's all about me. How about this? I'll have a blue Christmas without you. I have a, I have a Christmas playlist. I've got that one, and right after it, I've got white Christmas, so I can balance out the colors, right? Um, but uh, anyway, I'll have a blue Christmas without you, which nobody but Elvis should sing. Um, but uh, anyway... Uh, that one, yeah, that's again, kind of similar to the other one. It's all about me, my Christmas. You can't, you, you'll, you'll be doing all right with your Christmas of white, and you better feel bad about that and get back here because I'm having a blue Christmas without you. Probably the, okay, I said the worst song was simply having a wonderful Christmas time. Uh, I lied. The worst Christmas song ever written is Santa Baby, right? <laughs> is there a more selfish Christmas song than Santa Baby? Let me pick on one that I really like. This is on my running playlist. And I, I, I just love this song. It's beautiful. It's on the Polar Express. It's called Believe by Josh Groban. Uh, and it is, a, it is a beautiful song. And it's a terrible song. <laughs> I, I still listen to it. So I, I guess I'm not too principled. But in, 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 in uh, his rich voice and beautiful notes, Josh Groban sings, Believe in what your heart is saying. Hear the melody that's playing. There's no time to waste. There's so much to celebrate. Believe in what you feel inside and give your dreams the wings to fly. You have everything you need if you just believe. It's beautiful. It's also gobbledygook, right? Which is fine. It's just a Christmas song for a cute little Christmas uh, you know, story on, on a movie. I'm not saying, like I said, it's on my playlist. But, um, but basically it's... It's, it's not about Christmas. It's about snow and presents and getting what I want. <laughs> right? And so what's wrong with these Christmas songs? Well, they're really self-focused. 
right? They're, they're neither about Christ nor Christmas. They're about self. They're self-focused. And self-focused thinking is, is really part of our nature. I mean, that's just born into us. In Matthew 22 and verse 39, Jesus was teaching what are the two great commandments in the law. And he said the second of two, the first is love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He says the second is like the first one. And that is the, the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he has to command us to love our neighbors. You notice that? Uh, he does not have to command us to love ourselves. Uh, see, com- c- loving our neighbors doesn't come naturally, uh, and, and Jesus doesn't have to command ourse- us to love ourselves because that does come naturally. Loving ourselves comes so naturally that when Jesus commanded us to love our neighbors, he did so and commanded us to do so at the same level in which we love ourselves. In other words, love your neighbor, and then the, the, the question that comes out of that command is, how much should I love my neighbor? The answer is, as much as you love yourself. In the words of the great prophet Buzz Lightyear, that means to infinity and beyond. Amen? And, uh, uh, and so self-focused thinking is part of our nature. To quote the, the other great American prophet, Terrell Owens, I love me some me, right? Very honest man. Not, not the most likable man, but m- very honest And so self-focused thinking is part of our nature. Also, self-focused thinking is promoted in our society. Um, As we uh, noted, many Christmas songs are self-focused. In fact, I would venture to say that most popular songs in America, in our culture, have that same self-focus. Our culture promotes pride, which is the ultimate self-focus. And uh, from advertising to entertainment to political promises, our society demonstrates that it is driven by this self-focus. Also, self-focus, not only promoted by culture, but it's uh, destructive and it's divisive. Self-focus is destructive and divisive. If you do not think so, (laughs) then you've never been to a daycare, right? Uh, Go to a daycare and you will see that uh, if you put two self-focused people in a room, there's going to be some division and some divisiveness. Put two self-focused people as starters on a football team, and you'll watch the whole team fall apart. It's called uh, a lack of team chemistry at that point, right? Um, It it destroys unity. It is destructive and divisive. And so self-focused thinking also infiltrates Christian minds and Christian churches. And when self-focused... teaching does that, then discord is sown among the brethren, and, and, and uh, then infighting happens in the church. There were some members of the church at Philippi who, who in the first century, who exhibited self-focused thinking. That self-focused thinking began to be destructive, and it began to be divisive, and so in chapter 4 of Philippians, and verses 2 and 3, by the way, it's going to be two women in the church that are causing problems. Uh, don't, don't, don't turn your mind off, men, all right? It's not always women. It's just in this case. Many times it's men, too. But in verse 2 of chapter 4, uh, he says, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, which uh, with Clement also... And with many, uh, with other my fellow laborers who, whose names are in the book of life. And so two women in the church named Euodius and Syntyche, uh, they, they're named and, and admonished to become like-minded here. In other words, these two ladies were not getting along and there was strife in the church. And, and basically it was their fault. And, and I want you to notice something important about them in verse 3. Um, they were uh, believers. They were, they, they were not devils. They were believers. They, they weren't horrible people. They were members of the church in good standing. And furthermore, Paul, Paul commends them as women who had labored together with him in the gospel. That means they had an active ministry. But 
they were no longer of one mind in the Lord and they had become self-focused in their thinking and it was causing problems in that church. And you see, self-focused thinking is not a plague that just infects people of low character. It is a sin that worms its way into the mind of the best of us. And so it did in Grace Baptist Church of Philippi. And uh, I'm sure that's what it was called. And so Paul wrote in part to correct their thinking, uh, to correct their self-focused thinking. And in so doing, he writes chapter 2, from which we read our text. And in, it, in, in chapter Paul, or in chapter 2, <laughs> Paul says, this is how you should think. Don't think selfishly. This is how you should think. And as we move our minds from Grace Baptist Church in 1st century Philippi to Grace Baptist Church in 21st century Mawiqua, Paul says to us, don't think selfishly, this is how you should think. We are to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is the cure for self-focused thinking. We must be like Christ. How can we think like Christ? How can our mind match His mind? To think like Christ, our minds must be dominated by the humility of Christ. His, his way of thinking, his principle for thinking on this earth was humility. And that humility must dominate our minds and our thinking. Now how does that work? How does that play out in real life? To think like Christ, our minds must be dominated by humility to Christ. Well, let's look at how that plays out in real life. First of all, we must view humility, that, or we must view the humility of Christ as a mandate to obey. As a mandate to obey. Humility is not for us a better way or a friendlier way to live. Rather, it is the only way. It is a command from God to us for life. Humility, and, and the humility of Christ is mandated to us, and so we must approach that subject with an attitude of submission and an attitude of expectation to obey. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 of our text, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so there's an imperative. We are commanded to adjust our thinking. Let this mind be in you. That's a direct command. What does the word mind mean? Let this mind translates the, uh, a Greek word that is an imperative, phroneo. Phroneo means to think. All right? Phroneo means to think. And it means to regulate from within as, as an inner perspective or insight. That inward regulation then shows itself in a corresponding outward behavior. Fernetto is thinking. It is a personal opinion that fleshes itself out in action. For instance, um, some people are wrong about this, but some people think coffee is gross, all right? And uh, how many of you are not coffee drinkers, all right? Raise your hands. It's okay to be wrong about that. You live in South America. How can you not drink coffee? <laughs> your wife agrees. <laughs> so uh, anyway... <laughs> I don't mean to start anything between you two, but she's right, brother, all right? Uh, but uh, anyway, we've got the same thing going in my house in reverse, all right? Some people have an inward opinion that coffee is gross, and so they, they don't drink it. They try to substitute inferior drinks like hot chocolate or tea, uh, but basically that inward opinion manifests itself in an outward behavior. You take them into Starbucks, and all they look at is the price, Right? <laughs> Uh, and and uh, uh, the reverse of that is true. Some of us are correct in, in the opinion that uh, co coffee is really good. And, and so that manifests itself, that inward opinion manifests itself in an outward behavior. Hey, we're looking for it. We're drinking coffee, right? Every chance we get. All right? Uh, and <laughs> I got an amen in there. All right. So... Uh, that's, that's what Fernando means. It's an inward opinion that fleshes itself out in an outward behavior. So the mind of Christ refers to the thinking of Christ that is his inward opinion that fleshed itself out in an outward behavior. And so we are commanded to think as he thinks. That's the imperative. Now there's some instruction involved here too. He tells us, yes, you have to think this way. You have to, you have, to have the mind of Christ that's the imperative, but then he kind of shows us how that works. 
And so how does Jesus Christ think? What is his mind? It says, let this mind be in you. This mind was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, so what does the word this, to what does the word this refer when it says this mind? Well, this refers back to verses 2 through 4. The context of this passage. Look at verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Paul exhorts the church at Philippi to be like-minded in verse 2. And then, how could they be united in this way in their minds? How could they be united in their thinking, being like-minded? One phrase captures the answer to that question. It is this lowliness of mind in verse 3. Lowliness of mind simply means humility. Humility excludes all selfish motives. Nothing should be done, he says, through strife or basically selfish ambition or vainglory. That means conceit. Nothing should be done for those reasons, strife or vainglory. They were to expunge all selfish motivation from their thinking. Their view of others would have to be reversed. It's natural to think best of ourselves, to think highest of ourselves. We naturally give ourselves the benefit of all doubt. But we are to have a higher estimation of other members of the church than we have of ourselves. Is that fun? <laughs> Not always, right? Uh, and you say, well, that won't work. I mean, if I esteem others higher than myself, and they don't return the favor to me, then who's going to think about me? Well, there you go, thinking about yourself again. You see, in this command, there's no what-if clause. It's just simply given. It simply says, let every member of the church think of every other member of the church more highly than themselves. By the way, the answer to who's going to think about me, well, if nobody else does, Jesus will. All right, and no Christian walks alone in this life. So we are commanded to have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is lowliness of mind. It is humility. It is hum humility that considers others higher than ourselves. That is the mandate. We are constantly uh, to think that way constantly. Now, some people want to have just the normal, natural mindset punctuated by moments or even spurts of the mind of Christ. It's like going on a temporary diet, all right? Um, a lot of times, especially after Thanksgiving, uh, we notice that we might be putting on a little too much weight. We'd like to be in a little better shape. And so we set a goal. I'm going to lose 20 pounds. I set that goal. And to reach that goal, we adjust our eating schedule and, our, and what we eat and our intake. And we, we, we might buy into a program or something like that and say, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. And lo and behold, about three months into this thing, you step on the scale and, it's, and, and you look and you've lost 25 pounds. And we're like, wow, that's, that's awesome. Now I've accomplished my goal. Now I can go back to what I was doing before. Um, what happens next? We gain all that weight back, probably faster than we lost it. Um, and and uh, so if we want weight loss to be permanent, you guys didn't know you were coming for some life coaching, did you? Uh, but uh, if we want that weight loss to be permanent, we can't settle for a temporary change of diet. We have to commit to a lifestyle change. And so some Christians want a temporary diet model of humble, humble thinking. Normal thinking most of the time and then some punctuated by spurts of lowliness of mind, the mind of Christ. And so that when interpersonal problem arises, we go for humble, <laughs> get humble. And then when the problem is resolved, we go right back to the way we were thinking before. Christ does not call us to moments of, or even periods of, humility. He calls us to a lifestyle change, a life of humility. Uh, and that is our mindset. It is a whole lifestyle change. It is permanent, period. Our minds that's why I say our minds must be dominated by the humility of Christ. The Apostle Paul's life was dominated by 
this thinking of Christ, this mind of Christ. He had, um, I don't know if anybody made any, other than Christ, I don't know if anybody made any more sacrifice for the gospel other than the Apostle Paul. He had made all these great sacrifices to preach the gospel of Christ, and for that effort, Paul was thrown into prison, not before being beaten. And on top of that, several so-called preachers or ministers or Christians, they were going around using Paul's imprisonment as a means to denigrate him and to build up their own following. <clears throat> what would Paul do in that situation if he was self-focused in his thinking? Well, for one, he probably would have wallowed in self-pity in that prison cell. Perhaps he might have even quit his ministry. Maybe he would even start blaming God for all his problems. God, I did all these things for you. Look where I am. But Paul had the mind of Christ, the mind of humility. And so we see that expressed in chapter 1 and verse 12. Uh, he says, But I would that ye understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me, what things happened to him? Uh, shipwreck, beating, prison, uh, people tearing him down. The things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some of also of good will. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Wow. There's a man who, if, if, uh, if I'm in his place, I don't write that scripture. Sorry, I'm just not writing it that way. I might have an axe to grind somewhere. But do you see that? Paul's main focus is not himself. It is not his own honor. It is not his own comfort or his own reputation. His focus is on the gospel of Christ and the fact that people are being saved through it. His focus was entirely on others. And as a result, he was thrown into prison. And when others slandered him, how did he respond? He said, I rejoice, and I'm going to continue rejoicing. You see, to think like Christ, our minds must be dominated by the humility of Christ. We must view the humility of Christ as a mandate to obey. How are we to obey that mandate? How do we think like Christ? We must view the humility of Christ not only as a mandate to obey, but as a model to follow as a model to follow. Uh, to think like Christ, our minds must not just be dominated by humility, but dominated by the humility of Christ. We need to cultivate the type of humility that Christ demonstrated for us. What does thinking like Christ look like in real life? Well, it looks like us doing what he did. Now, maybe not you know, manifesting all the same exact things. Like, I'm not going to go raise someone from the dead because Christ did, okay, right? That's, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to go heal somebody with leprosy, all right? I might recommend a doctor or something, but I'm not going to perform. Because that is not what Christ has called me to do. Christ has called me to, dem to follow the humility that he demonstrated. Um, we must follow his model of humility, first of all, in self-denial. Self-denial. Philippians 2.6, Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You know, at Christmas time, we're prone to think about Bethlehem. And, and it's good for us to do that. Bethlehem is the, it, it was a little town where the prophet Micah prophesied that, that the Christ would be born. Bethlehem is the city of David the city of Christ the Lord. In Bethlehem, a virgin gave birth to the Son of God. In Bethlehem, God became flesh, and the Savior of the world entered into the world. It was at Bethlehem that a shining angel host exploded across the sky and sang glory to God in the highest and on earth, 
peace, goodwill toward men. It was at Bethlehem that the shepherds then, who had heard the angels sing, came and entered into the stable to worship the great shepherd who lay in the manger wrapped in swaddling clothes as they had been told at Christmas time. We think about Bethlehem. We, think, we sing about Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is to us a little town of wonder and glory. But you ever stop and think, what was Bethlehem to the child in the manger? What was Bethlehem to Christ? Consider for a moment who it was that was laying in that manger. What child is this? This was the second person of the Trinity. He is God of very God. He is in the form of God. The word form here in our text translates the Greek word morphe. It means the outward display of an inner reality or substance. In other words, it's not just an outer shell, but it is, a, it is the reflection of what is real on the inside. This simply means that in eternity past, Jesus Christ was God. And now there he is laying in the manger. John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 14, and the Word was made flesh, God was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we get to the part that exposes the mind of Christ to us. Remember, we're talking about the thinking of Jesus. Our text says, that Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. See that word thought? He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? Jesus was in the form of God. We have already established that Jesus was in fact God. Um, but look at what he thought about that. Speaking of God the Father, he thought, it, he thought that equality with God for Jesus was not robbery. Robbery... Uh, Robbery translates the Greek word harpogmos, and harpogmos means a prize. It means something to hold on to, to cling tightly to. This word has two types, two senses that can be used in an active or a passive. The active sense is robbery, to grasp, to grab something in robbery. The passive sense is a prize gained by robbery. So uh, the active sense is stealing it, and the passive sense is holding on to what I've stolen so no one else gets it. What does all that mean? Well, Jesus looked at his equality with God the Father, and he never thought, hey, I really don't deserve this. I gained it by robbery. I'd better hold on to this and not lose it. In other words, considering his equality with God the Father, Jesus honestly thought and could say, I deserve this glory. It is who I am. And at the same time, thinking that, Jesus humbled himself to say, I do not have to grasp this. I do not have to hold on to it. I didn't steal it. I, I don't have to hold on to it so tightly. And being equal with God the Father, Christ deserves infinite glory. That's who he is. But we find him in Bethlehem, not in glory. A baby, no less, who cannot at this point talk or change his own diaper. In a manger, not in a gold crest, crested crib, not breathing filtered air, but Breathing dung-filled air, because a manger is in a stable where animals stay. And it's not like the live animal plays you see in some big churches where they clean up if there's an accident, right? That's where he is. He deserved infinite glory, but Christ discarded infinite glory. Verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Though king in heaven, he chose to be born a servant on earth. The wise men came from the east and they assumed that Jesus would be born in Jerusalem. Why did they assume that? Well, Jerusalem is the king of, or is the city of kings. They searched for him at the palace, but Jesus was born in a stable. But that it, it, that is really small potatoes when we think about something else. The difference between a palace and a stable is slight in comparison to the difference between the throne of glory in heaven and any place on earth. In other words, when Jesus stepped down to earth, 
the biggest step was the step down to earth. It wasn't a big step for him from a palace to a stable. Our text says that Jesus made himself of no reputation. That phrase translates another Greek phrase where we get the word kenosis. And it literally means that he emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself. And he took the form of a man, and not just any man, not a king, but a servant. And of what did Christ empty himself? What did he, what did he cast aside or mask? Well, Jesus remained God. He did not empty himself of deity. Rather, Jesus emptied himself of his glory. All the glory that Jesus had in heaven... He deserved infinite glory, and he discarded that infinite glory. He laid it aside to descend to earth, to take on human flesh, a servant, and to walk here as one of us coming to earth. Jesus masked the glory of his nature in human flesh. One time before his resurrection, Jesus decided to reveal that glory. And he pulled aside the mask on the mountain of transfiguration, and Peter, James, and John could not look at him. The sight was so spectacular. Another time, Jesus was in prayer with his father uh, in intercessory prayer before he would go to the cross. John chapter 17 and verse 5, he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Notice Jesus says, the glory which I had. He speaks in the past tense because he no longer had that glory while he was here on earth. He had laid his glory aside coming to earth as a man. This is the mind of Christ. He deserved infinite glory. And he was willing to discard that infinite glory. Jesus' discarding of glory was the ultimate in self-denial. We have so much less glory to discard than he did, and yet so often, we view it as something to be grasped. Something to which we must cling tightly. Jesus discarded the glory uh, of eternity. That was the ultimate self-denial. We must follow his model in humility and self-denial. The humility of Christ says, Consider others higher than yourself. For Christ considered you higher than himself. So not only self-denial, Christ modeled that for us, but we must also model his humility in self-sacrifice. In self-sacrifice. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, the majority of Christians who live and die on this planet do not have to give themselves to a martyr's death. Some of them do. But the majority of us don't have to do that. Christ came to this earth, lived as, as a servant, a sinless life, and then he obeyed death. He, he died. Why did he die? Because the wages of our sin is death. Death. We earned that. And he took it for us. Christ, not only, but he, I want you to notice this word in our text, in verse 8. He, he became obedient unto death. Look at this word, even the death of the cross. In other words, it's saying, not just death, but he took it further than that. The death of the cross. See, the death of the cross, to die on a cross was to die a public death. Being condemned by the law as a criminal, it was a, it was a, a, a painful and horrible death, but it was also a slanderous death for him because he was accused of something he did not do. But then again, he was dying for something he did not do. He was dying for sin, yours and mine. So Christ modeled for us humility in self-denial and self-sacrifice. So to think like Christ, our minds must be dominated by humility the, the humility of Christ. This is a mandate for us to obey. This is a model for us to follow. James chapter 4 verse 6 says that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. You cannot begin to have the mind of Christ until you have Christ himself. 
Have you ever turned away from your pride and your sin and turned to Jesus Christ to save your soul? See, is, is Jesus your, your Savior? Is He your Lord? The first step towards salvation is to humble yourself enough to admit that you are a sinner and that you deserve God's punishment for your sins. Jesus showed us what God's punishment for sin is. It is death and it's a painful one. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 follows that up and says, For God, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 lays it out simply for us, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Believing in the death, resurrection of Christ and confessing Him as Lord by faith, you will be saved. If you have not been saved, I ask you this morning to trust Christ. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You can do that now. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you think like Christ thinks? Have you let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus? I quote in closing J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer says of this text, he says, In Philippians 2, we read that the Son of God laid aside His divine glory and became your servant and mine by being made in human likeness and dying on the cross for our sins. Following His example means letting the mind of Christ be in us and humbly serving others, that is the true spirit of Christmas. And so, Merry Christmas. Let this mind be in you. Let's stand together.